Hey, friends, and welcome to our first erotic story of our drunk and smutty Christmas series. I'll be reading a couple of passages from The Boudoir, a magazine of scandal. Oh, my. The question is, are you ready? <laughs> Tis the season. I hope you're ready to spend a naughty holiday season together. You won't need your hot beverage or a crackling fire to keep you warm. No, no, no. This holiday season, I'll be keeping you warm with all sorts of lustful, carnal, dare I say, obscene tales from the masters of smut. Grab your favorite ardent spirit. Ardent spirit? Aquavitae, grog, hooch, Alcohol, my love. Get cozy and let your mind wander as you listen to me read indecent and downright lewd passages from selected Victorian erotica. Listener's discretion is strongly advised as I'll be reading sexually explicit material. You have been warned. <laughs> Hey friends, fellow fiends, past lovers, and future loves. I hope you all had a lovely and safe weekend and that you started your week off right. Before we get into it, I wanted to apologize for the delay. I've been experiencing technical difficulties, and also life has gotten in the way. But without further ado, let's get into it. So as I previously mentioned, I'll be reading from The Boudoir, a magazine of scandal. So you're probably asking me, well, what is this? Well, it was an erotic magazine published in London in the 1880s by William Lassenby. It was a continuation of The Pearl and existed between 1883 and 1884. It was reprinted as The Boudoir, a Victorian magazine of scandal by Groves Press in New York in 1971. The story that I've picked from the boudoir is A Tale of London Everyday Life, and I'll be reading two chapters. First chapter is to get an idea of who our protagonist is, and the second chapter, it's where all the fun begins. So, just a friendly reminder, listener's discretion is strongly advised. Chapter 1, The Young Man from the Country Charles Warner, the son of a wealthy squire who owned a large estate in the Midlands, had just arrived in town and taken up his apartments in Gower Street for the purpose of becoming a medical student. As of course being only a younger son and their freehold property all entailed, his jolly parent can think of nothing better in which his sharpest boy, as he called Charlie, would be so likely to make his way in the world. Be a good lad, Charlie. Stick to your profession and I'll set you up with 10,000 when you marry a girl with some tin. That's the only thing a younger son can do. Should I die before that, it's left you in my will. Your allowance is 300 pound a year, to be 500 pound when you come of age. But mind, if you disgrace me or get into debt, I will turn you adrift without a penny, or pay your passage to Australia to get rid of you. My boy, he finally added, a tear in his eye and a slight quiver of the lip. You have always been a favorite. Your old dad reckons on you to keep away from the girls and bad companions. He was thinking over these last parting words of his father as he sat by the fireside after tea, awaiting the call of his two cousins, Harry and Frank Mortimer, who had written to say they would call to take him out and to see how he liked the rooms they had found for him. Chapter 2. Three Pretty Milliners My cousin, Charlie Warner, just from the country to become a medical student. Miss Bessie, Annie, and Rosa Robinson. 
Three as pretty and lovely little milliners as you ever saw or will see again, said Harry, making the introduction as they entered. The brothers kissed all three girls, and as it seemed the correct thing, Charlie was not slow to follow their example, beginning with Rosa, the youngest, a fair, golden-haired little beauty of seventeen, then Annie, with her light brown hair and hazel eyes, and finishing with Miss Bessie, a twenty-year-old darling with dark, auburn hair, and such a pair of glancing eyes as would almost ravish the soul of any soft-hearted youth who had not a stronger mind than our young hero, who looked on all girls as playthings rather than as being worthy of serious love. This motherfucker. I never said I wouldn't make any comments. What a pretty supper the confectioners have sent in for you. Fowls, tongue, and champagne. It made us rather expect something unusual, and we are so pleased to see Mr. Warner. Besides, you know there is no jealousy here, said Annie, adding, And you, Frank, are my partner for the evening, as Harry was my cavalier last time. And I'm so glad there's Mr. Warner for Rosa. Although Bessie and I shall feel rather jealous about it, we can't wait for our turns another day. This is the jolliest place I know of, said Harry, handing Bessie to her seat at the table. Everything ready to hand, and nothing cleared away till we are gone. No parlor maids to wait on us or listen to every word, and we can do as we like. Not exactly, sir, put in Annie. Even when the light is out, you must behave yourselves. <laughs> okay. We have a little longer this evening for our dark seance, said Frank. We are taking Charlie to the theater and to Scott's for supper, so they don't expect us till half past twelve or so. And the housekeeper will sit up for her reward, won't she, Harry? The question that's burning in my mind is, what kind of reward? What's that, pouted Rosa, giving a sly look. Oh, those two boys are dreadful. Just as if they would want any more of that when they got home. Oh, she never tells tales, so we kiss her, answered Frank. Is that all you do, Frank? Tell that to your grandmother. As if you could kiss without taking other liberties, sir, said Annie. This kind of badinage lasted all supper time, but Charlie pledged the sisters one after the other so as not to show any marked preference. Still, at the same time, in a quiet sort of way, he tried all he could to make himself particularly agreeable to Rosa, who evidently was rather taken with him. It's so nice to have you to myself, she said, as the supper had come to an end. But mind you're not too naughty when they turn out the gas. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. Something in her deep blue eyes and look so fired his feelings that taking her unresisting hand under the table, he placed it on his thigh, just over the most sensitive member of the male organization, and was at once rewarded by the gentle pressures of her fingers, which assured him she quite understood the delicate attention. The others were too absorbed in some similar manipulation to notice Charlie and Rosa, as he adroitly unfastened about three buttons of his trousers and directing her hand to the place, and presently felt she had quite grasped the naked truth, which fluttered under the delicious fingering in such a way that very few motions of her delicate hand brought on such an ecstatic flood of bliss as quite to astonish Miss Rosa and necessitate the sly application of a mouchoir to her slimy fingers. As at the same time she crimsoned to the roots of her hair, and looked quite confused, whilst he could feel that a tremor shot through her whole frame. Fortunately, just at that moment, Bessie turned off the gas. Oh my! And instinctively, the lips of Charlie and Rosa met in a long, impassioned kiss. Tongue to tongue, they reveled in a blissful osculation. He could hear a slight shuffling and one or two deep-drawn sighs, as if the ladies felt rather agitated. There was a convenient sofa in a recess just behind Charlie's chair, and Rosa seemed to understand him so well that he affected a strategic movement to the more commodious seat under the cover of darkness. There he had the delightful girl close to his side, with his right arm round her waist. 
whilst his left hand found no resistance in its voyage of discovery under her clothes. What mossy treasures his fingers searched out. Whilst for her part, one arm was round his neck, and the warm touches of her right hand amply repaid his Cytherean investigations in the regions of bliss. His fiery kisses roved from her lips all over her face and neck, till, by a little maneuvering, he managed to take possession of the heaving globes of her bosom. My, my, it's getting a little bit hot. How she shuddered with ecstasy as his lips drew in one of her nipples and gently sucked the delicious morsel. A very few moments of this exciting dalliance was too much for her. She sank back on the couch so that he naturally took his proper position. And in almost less time than it takes to write it, the last act of love was an accomplished fact. Then followed delicious kissings and toyings. No part of her person was neglected. And when, as a finale, she surrendered the moist, dewy lips of the grotto of love itself to his warm tonguings, the excess of voluptuous emotion so overcame her that she almost screamed with delight. When the crisis came again and again in that rapid succession, only possible with girls of her age. They had been too well occupied to hear or notice anything about Bessie and Annie with their partners, but now an almost perfect silence prevailed in the apartment, till presently Harry spoke out, saying, I think the spirits have had long enough to amuse themselves. What do you say to a light? This was agreed to, and they spent another half hour with the ladies before taking leave of them for the night. It was as curious a feast of love as Charlie could possibly have imagined, and he was quite puzzled to make out what manner of girls these three sisters could be, who bashfully objected to a light on their actions, and yet were as free with their partners as any of the mercenary members of the Demimonde could have been. "'What a darling you are,' whispered Rosa to Charlie as he took a parting kiss." but I shan't have you next time unless there is an undress romp in the dark. Bessie pressed them to come to an early tea on Sunday and have a long evening when they would arrange some pretty game to amuse them. This was agreed to with many sweet kisses and au revoir. Whew! I don't know about you, but I'm fanning myself to cool down. I'm not sure if it's the story coupled with my imagination or the vest show I'm drinking that's making me flustered. Either way, I hope you enjoyed our first erotic story in our drunk and smutty Christmas series. Tune in on Thursday as I read another passage from another Victorian erotic novel. I'm not making any promises, but the next one might be even more obscene. Oh my... I'm Carissa Vickis, and this was Beauty Unlocks Drunk and Smutty Christmas.